December 19, 1897. In the folklore of the polar latitudes, the legend of a flying Dutchman is of very late origin. Who shall say this strange story, well known to the pelt and blubber hunters of the north, but told here in print for the first time, did not reach the ears of Nansen and embolden him in the theory of the transpolar current. The apparition of a strange vessel many years ago off Cape Sivernoy inspired among the Siberian Tuskies an elaborate fable which the amphibious travelers of the kayaks spread among the Eskimo hamlets on the shores of the North Sea. When the vessel was first observed by the natives, it was standing offshore, south of Wrangell Island, in a May gale as if plunging through the southbound ice pack. Its ghostly hull and rakish rigging loomed up indistinctly through the sleet and mist of the polar hurricane and vanished in the gloom. She came from the icebound north, where no human being lived, and in her flight before the storm, the fanciful Tusky saw in her a mysterious messenger from the fabled beings their fathers had told of that lived in that ice-locked land. Now, a vessel that hails from that region and carries no sign of distress, that does not trade, and that gives no sign of familiar life, is something to be talked about by curious natives to whom the arrival of a vessel is a tremendous advent. As the story traveled from mouth to mouth, the mysterious vessel was given all sorts of fantastical embellishments and a crew of weird beings from a faraway continent. In their simple stories, the Tuskies declared that these beings did not come to trade or explore, but to lure foolish hunters or fishers to their doom. In the mysterious vessel, they saw a bait to tempt the foolhardy white men of the warm south to more reckless daring in search of the mysterious northern land inhabited by these wonderful beings. Though the theory of myth and the fancy of the Lorelei was preserved, the fable changed in form and substance as it traveled eastward on the Arctic Circle. The strange craft there took on Herculean dimensions as a monster uniac with balloon sails and manned by giant ice gods. Sometimes it appeared etherealized with wings. At last, so it was said, the strange craft was seen in reality off the east coast of the Bering Sea, a fleeting thing of a thousand sails and the elongation of a sea serpent in the faraway fluorescence of an aurora. Hanging over it in the polar heavens was a crown of tremendous rays. The stars fluttered, the dazzling prisms dissolved into phosphorescent whiteness, and then the specter sped away into the abysmal blackness of the horizon. Once the marvel was reported to have been observed off Herschel Island, like a speck on the remote fringe of the winter pack, flying before a southwester for the pole. Another time, the natives of Prince of Wales Island testified to having caught sight of this fabled flying Eskimo skimming into the south. They watched diligently for its reappearance, but in vain. It disappeared again in the direction of the pole whence it came. The hard-headed, incredulous old whalers had a hard time making anything tangible out of these fables of a flying Eskimo ghost ship or whatever phenomenon or ordinary thing the Indians had seen. Even those among the superstitious sailors who were prone to believe almost any tale of mystery concerning the sea could hardly accept the yarn of a sea serpent ship navigated by a crew of natives from the land at the North Pole. But the closer the whalers questioned the excited and talkative natives, the clearer it became that they had seen a mysterious craft of some kind, and that they really had some foundation for their wild stories. The natives at Belcher Point, said Jim Wheeler, an intelligent New England whaler who was out with the fleet of 1888, were sure that this ghost ship was some sort of messenger from the other world. They conceived the place to be an island paradise at the polar center, 
reserved for the good and great Eskimos, and governed by strange Eskimo spirits. Their idea was that some terrible catastrophe was about to visit the world, a kind of universal shake-up. At the same time, farther to the east, the natives believed the queer ship was, well, a hallucination, a device of fiendish spirits of the polar region to entice explorers and hunters to their deaths. This new tradition of theirs about the ghost ship that always appeared beating through the ice pack they accepted with keen delight. It is almost too bad the vessel didn't tie up at the pole before it made the last voyage out that wrecked an Indian story that might have given birth to no end of interesting fables and mythical literature. Here is the true story of this mysterious ghost ship, or flying Eskimo, that has been puzzling the northern whalers and wandering Eskimo for years past. One fair June day, the few Americans who had wintered in the far northern settlements of natives at Cape Smith were astonished to see approaching on the distant western sea and in the path of the spring ice flows, a little speck which at first they took for an approaching steamer. The Arctic jam was just breaking and it was remarkably early for such an arrival. Expectantly and speculatively, the daring visitor watched until it loomed up apparently under fore and aft sails and with jibs and staysails set, when within about ten miles, however, it was plain that the vessel was a partly dismantled bark set firmly in a ragged field of ice, which was moving eastward at the rate of five or six miles an hour. There was no signal of distress flying. The Americans on shore discharged their firearms without attracting any notice from those on board. The Americans on shore soon felt certain that the luckless crew must have met with some terrible disaster. To a man, they believed that the strange vessel was the floating remnant of luckless whalers caught in the ice pack the previous fall. No time was lost in jumping into kayaks and putting off to the derelict. From the ice rim, it was three miles across the field to the bark. Once on board, the rescuers found her to be the whaler Young Phoenix of San Francisco. A hurried search was made, but nothing ghastly or ghostly was discovered, nothing but deep scars and wrenched furnishings that showed the terrible storms and voyaging the vessel had gone through. The mizzen mast and jib boom were gone. To the fore and aft yards, small tatters and shreds of sail were still hanging. Her hold was half filled with frozen water. No doubt this solid cargo of ice was all that carried her hull safely through the jams and grindings of the battling ice packs. The searchers looked up her story and found that on her last trip, this tattered and battered derelict had been pursuing her lonesome patrol of the Arctic Ocean. It is considered as entirely likely by experienced whalers that she may have floated across or very near the pole, in her circuit from the American to the Asiatic coast. Could she have spoken? What a narrative of the polar mysteries she might have told. But her eccentric journeyings were not at an end. While the curious visitors from Cape Smith were rummaging in her cabins, the ice field in which the vessel was locked swung away from the coast and the lonely derelict took up her travels again towards the distant pole. The visitors took away such instruments and portable things as were still serviceable, and left her amid the drifting ice field thirty miles at sea. They had drifted twenty miles while they were on board of her. The last scene of the young phoenix that summer was when she disappeared at nightfall into the dim and distant north. The following year, Captain Warren of the Triton since crushed to death against the Belvedere loggerhead by a whale, overhauled the young phoenix in an ice floe on her last reported trip from the north. He took from her some chain and other materials. In the intervening years, her apparition has not been spoken of. Is she at the bottom of the Arctic, or harbored permanently in the farthest northern ice, lodged in the crystallized paradise of the Eskimo? 
In her unknown voyages, does she ever pass that bit of land or sea spot which polar explorers have struggled so long to reach? Had Nansen and Andre been passengers on her, would their hearts have been gladdened with a sight of the most northernmost point of the globe? How the young phoenix became a derelict, a periodically reappearing ghost ship amid the ice flows of the distant waters of the north, is one of its stories of wild storms and terrible wrecks. She was abandoned by her crew as a helpless wreck, given over for dead. That's why some seamen give her the name Ghost Ship. Years ago, she was one of a fleet of 12 whalers lying off the west shore of Point Burrow, the northernmost point on the American continent. It was August and a terrific storm came up from the southwest something most unusual for that season of the year. Imagine a huge mushroom-shaped projection of land with a cap facing the north, and you have a perfect idea of Point Burrow. On both sides of the stem and between the crown of the point and the outlying sand shoals is excellent harborage, though of course the safest of the three places is under that part of the crown which happens to be leeward of a storm. What is known as a lagoon or anchorage against southwest storms is on the east side of the stem of land. When this memorable August hurricane swept out of a clear southern sky, the whaling fleet promptly scampered around to leeward between the crown of the point and the shoals and cast anchor. The fury of the storm was so increased that the young Phoenix, the Mary and Susan, the Fleet Wing, and the Jane Grey dragged their anchors. The Jane Grey, a fine schooner, was picked up bodily by the giant waves and smashed completely to pieces. Her crew were saved by great good luck and heroism. The Mary and Susan and the Fleet Wing were stranded on the shoals. The rest of the fleet slipped cables and put to sea. The young phoenix, in striking the shoal stern on, lost her rudder. She broached to, collided with a bounding billow, and carried away the foreyard and boats of the latter. The young phoenix lost her flying jib boom in the crash. The ships then separated, the young phoenix, without her rudder, scurrying northward on the port tack. Every effort was made by the crew to wear round. The mizzen mast was cut away, and all sail made forward but without effect. By this time, she had worked herself far offshore and was beating into heavy ice. In this terrible mess, the crew saw nothing else to do but abandon the fated vessel. At two o'clock in the morning, the tempest still raging, the crew tumbled into the small boats. They were rescued at daylight by the steam bark Orca. The abandoned young phoenix drifted poleward before the driving storm, and that's the last the whaler saw of her that season. And that is the way she began her unrecorded and mysterious travels in unexplored North Seas. Her remarkable drifting sense goes far to prove the correctness of Nansen's theory that the Arctic Ocean is a wide river having a current that sets poleward, and that a vessel capable of withstanding the force of the ice pack might in time be borne across the pole station. Some mariners argue that Nansen may be in error in assuming that this polar drift does not touch any part of the American continent. Captain Elwood S. West of the Horatio, who witnessed the Point Barrow disaster when the abandoned vessel disappeared in the north, has very decided opinions on the subject. The captain is exceptionally intelligent. Moreover, he is a close student of Arctic exploration. When the young phoenix passed northward in the ice, and later driftings when she followed the same track after having been boarded off Cape Smith, she coursed along the 160th meridian. The distance she drifted in and out of the ice packs, and the question as to whether she is imprisoned in a crush of ice now moving across the pole that will eventually drift out on the Spitsbergen side, are subjects of speculation. Captain West's observations convince him that a strong polar current, practically from spring to fall, 
courses from the break of the American continent at Point Burrow, due north. He believes that if taken advantage of in some fortunate season, when this side of the Arctic Ocean is exceptionally open, a condition which occurs once in every four or five years, a vessel built on lines similar to those of the Fram could penetrate to a point where the winter setback of the current would affect her so little that in another year or two she could make across or closely pass the pole. In other words, the polar current has no continuous set, but follows a course to and fro between the American coast and the pole. During the lesser number of months in the year, when the ice pack is heaviest, it moves with the course of the wind, which is southwest. This might be described as the setback from the pole. The remainder of the year, including the open season, the current and ice drift much more rapid then, are governed by an unvarying southwest wind which blows on to the pole. The young phoenix has gone north at least three times on this current, after having been beaten back two seasons below the 70th parallel. As her hold is solid with frozen water, it is not improbable that having finally voyaged north in one of the exceptionally open years, she has passed the line of the reactive tides and is now wedged in the mass that is slowly crunching over the pole and south on the Atlantic side. Will Atlantic mariners be the ones to catch the next glimpse of this wandering ghost ship? This article appeared in the San Francisco Call, December 19, 1897. This is a Country Road production because history is fascinating.